Oh, good. That is actually. No, I saw you running back and forth. You did accomplish much. I actually wasn't running back and forth all that much. Maybe just the, the time that I saw. I think it was right there. I don't know. I think that was just me getting my clothes to the washroom, too. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I just pretty much try to stay in the basement when I've got one going, you know, I'm not like, yeah. running up and down flights of stairs. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Like, it's time. Yeah. I just tend to study my own work. Like, it's time. Mm -hmm. It does. Especially after, like, Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, of a cereal crop. 
Uh, the technical biological definition of you know, list things that are in it. Uh, Tells me names like rice? Um, not necessarily. Um, Bread, yeah. Other things um, that you don't like them. Um, I can tell already. Um, other things that people uh, would uh, would grow, and things like, for instance, cabbage becomes important in China. Uh, later on, soybeans. Um, I definitely shouldn't have put it up so early. Uh, <laughs> um, and we, as in other places too, um, once people settle down for agriculture, it also means simultaneously uh, that uh, they can begin to domesticate animals. And some of these, are, again, are ones that we've heard about already. You know, hay, sheep, uh, cattle, chicken, all of these things that we've seen in other civilizations, perhaps less tastefully to our ears too, a uh, dog. And obviously less tastefully to a funny reaction, but kind of they eat this little guy, the bamboo rat, as well. Even though the Chinese had settled uh, on the land, though, it is fair to say that uh, hunting was still practiced. And in some cases, hunting, like, for instance, things like deer. Um, in other cases, too, are uh, things that you may not anticipate. Um, in ancient China, believe it or not, um, very large mammals still existed, including. Uh, this is someone who had actually seen a rhino. Uh, in fact, we know that a rhino and an uh, elephant uh, lived in ancient China and just sort of wandered around. Uh, again, uh, the ancient Chinese became very good at hunting, which is why they don't exist anymore there. Once you have rain uh, and uh, agriculture, you also then have uh, the ability to funnel some of that money into other things. Uh, and uh, we begin to see in ancient China the growth of pottery, um, especially this um, very interesting kind of um, red and black design for whatever reason. Uh, comes up on a lot of very early uh, pottery that we have from China. People begin to carve as well. Uh, it's maybe hard to see, but this is a little face uh, carved in jade. We have other carvings done in jade. Uh, all likely also in wood, although those don't tend to last as well uh, to the modern period. We also get things like this. Um, and you may wonder yourself, why would you build something that looks like this? This is seems impractical. Uh, and that's exactly what people who found, discovered these things tended to think. Um, and they sometimes refer to these things as ceremonial vessels, which simply means it's some kind of vessel that you use probably as part of a ritual. Because we, you probably would not build something that looked like that if all you wanted to do was just store something in it. It would be impractical in design. This is also sometimes called a ceremonial vessel. How it was used, don't ask me. Uh, this thing is kind of looks like a duck. It really has no broader significance. I like it. From ancient China, too, of course. In that respect, as well. We also have discovered, even from a very early uh, stage of ancient uh, Chinese life, um, people actually um, they uh, begin to design for the first time chopsticks. So some sort of utensils to actually be able to eat food, uh, which you may think unremarkable, but the vast majority of the rest of the world was time was simply eating with their hands. So the fact that uh, they had seen it necessary to develop utensils was very, quite interesting. Right, and uh, we also see um, some of our items uh, appear to uh, be weapons, and shouldn't be surprised given other civilizations at the time. Um, in some cases, uh, some of our best preserved examples are not weapons that probably were used in battle because they're too pretty. Uh, so like something like this, you can tell, this is an axe head that uh, seems to be very sort of uh, um, it, it's stylized in how it was made. We'll also see, um, oh, uh, again, uh, occasionally um, you get just a hint of uh, what people may have uh, believed about the world. Um, one of the things that we've seen in some of the burials that we've uncovered uh, from ancient China uh, is that you sometimes will see jars like this um, that actually will contain still traces of food, meaning that um, they were burying their dead with food, which seems to imply, at least to us, that there was some kind of belief in the afterlife, or it would not have made any sense for them to commit uh, this to the ground. 
Um, again, just to give you some of the other examples of things. Again, another probably used for some sort of ritual. I just love this one. This is another sort of ceremonial axe head, uh, which as you can tell has a, a, a face in it. Uh, this is, again, something that probably someone hung up on their wall, as you can tell, this thing was not used uh, for axing. Uh, The narrative of our earliest time in China, uh, to be able to sort of put things together, especially on a political level, um, is quite difficult. Um, and um, this is in part because um, the kind of um, sort of long narrative sources that we would like, we do not have. And in fact, what we're all often forced to fall back upon is these kind of things, these finds like uh, uh, burials of early rulers are some of our best sources uh, to be able to reconstruct uh, what the sort of early sort of political life was like in China. The simple answer to the question of uh, what kind of politics they prefer was monarchy. Uh, and we can actually, um, uh, we have managed to uh, uncover the first two important uh, families or dynasties uh, who would rule over China. The first of these is known as the Shang, and the second of these, uh, which I'll talk about, is known as the Zhou, which is confusing. It starts with a Z, it's spelled Z H O U, the Zhou. All right. Both of these dynasties, these ruling houses, are extremely frustrating for us to talk about because uh, the sources are so scarce that, in fact, there have been historians in the past that would say, for instance, that these were basically fictions that were created. Uh, by later generations of kings uh, to just give themselves like a lineage that came in the past. We don't think that anymore. We've discovered enough from burials that we feel comfortable in saying uh, that these two families existed. We just still have to admit, though, our knowledge about them is limited. So what do we know? Um, the Shang is the first uh, of the major families that would begin to exert military dominance over the region in the Yellow River, that the Yellow River Valley. Um, we know that from the sources we have uh, that there initially uh, there were cities in this region, even uh, when the Shang come up, and this family begins to dominate them thoroughly. Uh, and uh, the kind of tools that they used are ones that both again appear to be things that I've talked about before. The Shang had developed chariots to use in war. Um, they had bronze weapons. And on top of that, of course, it never hurts to have foot soldiers. They had plenty of men. How they got these exactly is not clear, uh, but they definitely had enough military at their disposal. Uh, so we really think this is a question of military dominance, of coming in with these weapons. Uh, coming in with the numbers of people and beginning to uh, slowly incorporate more and more territory uh, under their wing. Please. So, how does one family just like acquire all of these things that like, can just rise to dominance? In this case of the Shang, we really honestly don't know. Um, if I were to, to, to guess, as a guess, probably, um, as part of this war, they take all sorts of things and then they distribute it out to the people who are their followers. So, um, probably they put together this military more quickly than others, and they began to successfully start conquering other people. And then you get more and more soldiers, the more stuff you can promise. Mm -hmm. Now that's just a total guess on my part, based upon what we know, which is not much, but it would make sense anyway. Um, just to show you again, now this is actually one of the kings of the Shang, uh, who you can get some idea of the kind of goods that they had. Uh, some of the things that we talked about before, um, but also if you look very closely, uh, it appears that kings uh, were also uh, buried with people we take to be servants or slaves. Which again, it seems to imply that there's an afterlife, but uh, um, that these people were essentially killed to serve their masters in death uh, as well as in life. Raw, raw, raw deal for them as well, probably. Uh, but uh, some of these um, these tombs are quite lavish. We have in some of them covered uh, minimal writing, but some writing, uh, meaning that um, this was clearly a literate culture. Um, they also 
uh, appeared, the, the implications of the sources that there was a court surrounding the king, and there were all sorts of people who served, in addition to just his soldiers. Uh, the, they had people like, for instance, who uh, clearly would keep records, uh, people who collect taxes, uh, people who would look at the stars to try to tell the future. Again, as king, that's something you want to know. We also find again uh, these, these these very similar kinds of uh, goodies inside the tombs of early kings, uh, which would show some what they were doing with their wealth. Uh, things presumably that in life um, they would have uh, displayed publicly. This doesn't look like it, but it's a bell. Uh, the ringer is inside. So far as we can tell, um, it, what it appears uh, ends up happening. Uh, is that um, once the Shang had dominated this region around the Yellow River, um, to people who they like, who uh, uh, noble families in essence, who would agree to support them, they would give land. So there was always sort of, um, there's kind of a deal. You know, once you get your land, as long as you agree to throw in your lot uh, with the Shang, and you support their reign. Um, and so they never really get rid of the, the independent nobles. Nobles have to pledge their loyalty, but there are other families around. Interestingly enough, too, we also think that the Shang, uh, for the first time, a very early time in China, uh, come up with a form of currency that they expect to be used in their territory. And uh, even though we don't have them today, some of our, our, uh, our uh, documents seem to imply that uh, they did initially build, uh, do building projects like, for instance, uh, fortifications, uh, building cities, but we can't see it now. We don't know what it looks like. All right. The second of the two major families that dominate China in this early phase is known as the Zhou, as I mentioned to you. Uh, and, uh, we think that um, the Zhou was another of these rival aristocratic families. Uh, and at some point, and again, the, the whole process is so obscure, uh, it's painful. But it, it appears that somehow the Zhou managed to collect around themselves uh, their own private army. Uh, and then, in essence, uh, they go ahead and fight against the Shang and beat them militarily. Uh, and then they began to dominate the same exact lands. Um, around the Yellow River. Uh, and uh, in many ways, um, we really do think that the show, there's a lot of continuity there. Although the people at the top change, what we don't think changes is much of the way that they, they reign. The show learned a lot from the Shen, from what we can tell. Um, they continued, for instance, to have these sort of very tight alliances with noble families that will predicate on the fact that the rulers are always giving out land to their friends, uh, their noble friends. They continue to um, um, have, we think, some similar cities that they helped to build up uh, and to support. Um, we think that um, on the physical level, the level of the things that we have from the show, it's sometimes very difficult for those archaeologists to deal with this uh, this early period to tell the difference between the two, because so much of the physical artwork, the things they produce, look very similar to what came before. There, there was a uh, this one has a mirror, by the way. If you're curious, uh, many of the things. This was um, a part of a chariot, uh, another part of a, a chariot. Uh, but most of the artwork appears to be very similar to us. And we think uh, the same sort of uh, uh, examples I showed you earlier, like um, the burials um, with all sorts of elaborate things. Those continue on uh, with very little change. Uh, so in effect, as some, at least uh, from what I've described to you now, then the Zhou is really just a picture of continuity with what came before. If there is a change, however, it comes not so much in the actual method of ruling, uh, but the ideology of leadership. Most people tend to think that this second family that took over China was well aware of just how easy it was to topple uh, uh, another family by violence. 
Uh, and so the show begin to look for a justification of their rule that goes beyond the fact that we can kill the other guy. Um, they want to be able to have something higher. And they came up with it. They, become, they begin to have this entirely new ideology of power that is sometimes referred to as the mandate of heaven. And um, what this idea is, essentially, is that um, you may think that kings come into power uh, because they're the ones who have the most military force. But that's not what they begin to teach publicly. Uh, they say that the reason we came into a power is because heaven itself has chosen us, chosen our family to be the leaders of China. Um, and uh, in fact, that is why they, they begin to say publicly, that's why we beat the Shang. Uh, we beat the Shang because the Shang had become wicked, evil, and so sapped of all their moral strength, we, the noble Zhou, were able then to, uh, to defeat them. Now, of course, this is, by the way, um, in, in our modern terminology, this is self-serving propaganda, uh, but it was very powerful propaganda. Please. Uh, so just a quick question. So because they're like, I don't know, burial and artwork is all very similar, what is the, like, how do historians, um, I guess, determine the two things? Is it based on like, written evidence? Uh, occasionally, people will be uh, buried with it. Um, there are occasionally slight differences uh, in, in, I would say, fashion or things that, that you see in one level you don't. Um, it's also sometimes um, where things are buried. One of the things especially archaeologists try to do is determine date based upon um, basically what layer of dirt things are buried under. So um, you can sometimes get a, a relative idea, at least, that this is something that's older than something else. Uh, but, uh, the other thing is, too, certain things, not everything, uh, can be dated. Like, for instance, if we're lucky enough to get things, something like wood, you can date that actually quite precisely. Um, and other things, just to a lesser degree. So these are all the games we can play to, to try to separate the two. But uh, it's very difficult to find. Uh, even sometimes some of these uh, uh, scientific dating methods, it gives us a range, but not a very precise date. So it can be frustrating. The, um, to just uh, sort of finish the thought, um, the reason why I care, I mentioned the mandate of heaven here too, is not just because this is something that's relevant to ancient China, uh, but once this idea was alive uh, and became part of the sort of political language of China, it existed for centuries. In fact, the mandate of heaven is mentioned in the 20th century in China uh, to give you some idea how powerful this was. And uh, later dynasties, later families, Will continue to use it and say, uh, in effect, the same exact process that happened to the Shang uh, happened uh, to the Zhou and to the later rulers. That once you become wicked and you neglect your duties, then heaven can choose again uh, who gets to be ruler. So you can recycle the same ideology. But it didn't. In any case, the Zhou in time will end up being defeated not so much by internal as by external enemies. Uh, and uh, uh, Groups of, of, they, of people they consider barbarians would eventually attack them seriously uh, and drive them out of power. What followed, interestingly enough, and really for a very long period uh, after these two families, was not another strong family to take its place, but instead a period of civil war. That the Chinese sometimes refer to as the period of the warring states. Many of these aristocratic families who had been kept in check as a result of having a powerful king now all of a sudden begin to rise up and they begin to take power to the local level using uh, their own private armies. Everyone begins now uh, to suit up for war, arm themselves locally, and they begin to enter into constant battles uh, with other Chinese families. Uh, and, uh, uh, in effect, um, this process will go on uh, for a period of uh, almost 200 years. So this is a very long civil war altogether. Uh, before finally, as we see next time we talk about China, one of these many families will manage to, in essence, to attack and to successfully eat all the other fish. Uh, but it's going to take a long time for that to happen. 
And so instead, what you get to see is a period of almost unending of small wars uh, between individual families, in which it's very difficult for any one family to gain the upper hand. Please. Was the light stream an autumn period, and would the dry Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm simplifying it a, a little bit just for, for it, it is, but uh, I'm simplifying just a little bit because um, if we're doing an entire um, thing on uh, AO and China as a whole, then I would talk more about it. But, uh, like many things, lots drop out uh, in the course of the these lectures. There's so much to cover. If I were to say, here's just another this sheet, by the way. If I were to identify um, throughout all of these different political changes, three things uh, that are particularly important uh, as constants that we see throughout all of this. Um, one of the things that's fascinating to us is that, and I started with the Yellow River Valley. Um, Chinese culture, you can see just on a physical level, is very attractive to those around it. And we begin to see the slow diffusion. Um, we, we can still see this through all sorts of um, archaeological finds, digs, of people beginning to imitate China, even those directly, not directly under its political and military influence. Um, and we see examples of its language, uh, its artwork, uh, even some of its religious practice. You slowly see that uh, people uh, really are interested in this, uh, even people who are not dominated by the Chinese yet. Um, and uh, this also includes, uh, we think, more cities going up in areas around China, on, on the Chinese map. We also see a second of these sort of big trends in this region. Uh, is that there was an enormous gap in ancient China between the people at the top of the social scale uh, and the people below. Uh, there's really a chasm. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been showing you plenty of uh, I showed you plenty of images of things we find in elite people's tombs. Um, the vast majority of people did not have cool stuff uh, to be buried with. Um, if you were a normal person in China, um, you may be have been buried with a clay pot, uh, and that's about it. It was really a very sort of simple kind of burials that people would have for the most part. Um, and uh, we think from the very few legal sources we have, it's obvious that uh, the way you were treated legally was basically determined by your status. Uh, and the way, the kind of ritual um, that you were able to engage in also was determined in part uh, by your status. Um, and, uh, it's very interesting to us is that the documents we have imply that um, the poor did not have ancestors who lived after death. They did, their spirits would just, they, they would be extinguished. Uh, you had to be rich enough to have ancestors who lived after death, uh, which is going to be a strange idea for us, but for them, um, it was a normal one. The last of these kind of big trends, and this is less maybe a trend and more of a kind of, a, a kind of interesting, cool source that we find. Uh, are these things here. Uh, and uh, these are things uh, that are known as oracles, or uh, oracle bones in this case. Uh, an oracle is any means to be able to tell the future. Oracle bones in particular are a Chinese specialty, uh, a means to use bones uh, in a very sort of interesting way to tell what the future will be. Uh, unless those people were worried already. Um, these are bones usually of a steer or tortoise. We're not talking about human bones uh, that people would use. Um, this is one good example of a well-preserved oracle bone. What people would do with oracle bones is simple. So you'll see notice, uh, they would uh, put Chinese pictograms uh, on uh, the oracle bones. Uh, then they would pose a question of something in the future to the bones. So for instance, um, battles, um, uh, economic success, uh, your family, all these kind of things you could pose questions about. Uh, and then what you would do was you would take a pin, um, you, a metal pin, you would heat it in fire, and on the opposite side from where the writing was, you would stick the pin in, and then you would look very closely for where cracks developed uh, in your oracle bone. And you looked at those specific pictograms uh, and tried to use uh, to, to use them to construct some kind of answer that responded to the question. And, uh, 
that that is how local bones were used. This is uh, it's quite interesting, um, first of all, for a perspective of their spiritual beliefs. Uh, also, if you were people who studied the Chinese language, uh, they, these are absolutely precious because some of our earliest uh, examples of Chinese go back to the oracle bones. In some cases, the earliest uh, uh, sort of sign of how Chinese was written at an early stage. So in that respect, too, uh, they're essential. All this brings me to the second part of this lecture. Uh, and this uh, is a, a question of a, a kind of intellectual life uh, that comes specifically at the end of, of uh, the period I was talking about, the period of warring states that develops in China. Uh, and uh, it actually may surprise you to learn uh, that um, the period of warring states, far from being a time in which you know, no one was thinking or writing, uh, it actually uh, becomes one of the most fervent periods for writing in Chinese and intellectual thought. Um, and so rather than wars stopping people from uh, their sort of preaching and teaching, it actually ramps up the process. And uh, we think this is no accident. Um, people seeing chaos around them. They wanted to find some way, first of all, to bring an end to the chaos, and second of all, to make sure it never come back again. And so, in fact, these, all of these, these three uh, schools of thought I'll talk about all in their own way respond to violence or societal chaos. But what are the schools? The first of these, represented here by its most famous teacher, uh, is a school of thought known as Confucianism. Confucius is not this man's name, uh, not in, in uh, Chinese anyway. Um, I put his real name, Kung Fu Tzu, down on your, uh, uh, on your outline. The reason why we in the West refer to this man as Confucius is because when Western scholars started writing about him in the 17th century, uh, the common intellectual language was Latin. And so if you want to, uh, to talk about people, you had to give them a funny Latin name. Mine would be Johannes Romanus, which in my own way I like actually more than my real name. Uh, but in any case, um, that is the reason why in the West we refer to him as Confucius. And it's really just stuck at a census point, uh, so we still do that sometimes. Um, it is fair to say that uh, Confucius is more, uh, more profoundly respected uh, in, uh, uh, in China than any other philosopher. Uh, and I'm really to talk about. It appears that Confucius himself was someone who was, uh, came from the sort of lower ranks of the nobility. Uh, and uh, during uh, the period of foreign states, he had actually found some work uh, working for some of these small families. Um, as, uh, at one point, for instance, he was a minister of grain, making sure that grain was distributed and stored. Uh, but um, if that job sounds not exactly exciting, it wasn't. And um, it, does, it appears that it was a matter of frustration for Confucius that no one ever took his, uh, all of his ideas seriously enough in his own lifetime. And so he eventually decided to quit his day job entirely uh, and just become a teacher. Uh, that's all he did. Uh, and uh, in some ways, um, Confucius is a very rare bird. Um, he was what some people refer to as a reforming conservative. Uh, he was someone who was really thoroughly convinced that the political system had to be completely reformed. Uh, but he wanted to do it in such a way that rather than he felt um, innovative or you know, introducing radical ideas to his mind, he wanted to go back as far as possible to what he felt was the foundations of China. Uh, to, to, and use that, use this sort of supposedly extremely ancient past. Um, to uh, be a model for what the future should become. Uh, now, this is a myth that there was ever this age in China that um, everything was right, and you could, you could actually go back and find that golden age and replicate it. But Confucius himself obviously really believed in it, uh, and believed that we have to bring back you know, the old, good old days, uh, the good old norms where everyone knew um, uh, that society was better. 
And he clearly had one of his disciples as well, so he convinced others as well, too. In this past age that Confucius spoke about often, here's another Confucius fashion, um, the things that would have marked it out in comparison to his own age were, first of all, order. He wanted there to be a very strong order in society. Um, he wanted everyone to know his or her proper place in society. And he wanted to support any institutions in society that he felt would reinstate order above all else. So he liked, for instance, strong families. Uh, he liked hierarchy. Uh, he liked to, everyone to be very clear who is your betters and who are your inferiors. He also really supported uh, seniority. He felt that old people uh, had a lot to teach you. You had to listen a lot to old people. Um, he felt that uh, people had to spend a lot of time thinking very closely about uh, their, uh, how to behave properly, what was good for. Uh, but even as you did all these things, you were not, you didn't get anything out of it. Uh, he felt that virtue was its own reward. You should just be good because it's good. Uh, there's no, nothing else you get out of it. Now, there are things that would have set Confucius apart from people of his own time. Um, unlike most people in his time, he did not actually think nobility was something that came in your blood. He thinks, he thinks true nobility has to do with appropriate behavior. That was nobility, not that you had a higher family. Uh, and he actually um, begins to go after some of uh, the uh, pastimes of nobility in his own time. He says, listen, you guys just waste all your time fighting and killing one another. Uh, and he felt that that was not something that was a truly, a truly noble person would do. Uh, interestingly enough, um, we go to, um, especially from uh, that work that you read a portion of, the Analects of Confucius, um, it shows to um, his teaching method, as just as the sum of um, the Greek philosophers, we think really revolved around um, discussion. Um, that it, he really felt that it was um, one of the things that a good teacher could do is you, know, you pose questions, or your disciples pose questions of you, that this, this conversation helps to produce learning. I think he's a clear believer in all of that as well. Now, the main work for which Confucius is known, the Alex I mentioned to you, was not actually written by him. Um, and, and in fact, he didn't really preserve anything to write. It was his, his students who later on would cobble together his, uh, his teachings and put them in one place. Uh, and, once, and because people had such profound respect for Confucius, um, not only did they put together things that he had actually said, in time, um, if you had a, uh, all sorts of different works uh, that people wanted to be popular, they would put Confucius's name on them. And so there are, in fact, a lot of um, texts that are associated with his school that he certainly had absolutely nothing to do with. Uh, but in some cases, they respect his teaching. In other cases, uh, not so much. Uh, one of the weirder parts about um, Confucius, uh, at least in terms of um, many of the thinkers of, of his time, is that uh, we're very accustomed to people, um, especially in the ancient world, if you were a major thinker, you usually had something to say about the supernatural. You know, what is beyond our you know, spirits, gods. Uh, and uh, one of the things that really strikes us as being a little odd about Confucius is that um, he has nothing to say about the supernatural. Uh, and, and in fact, it, supposedly when one of his disciples once said something like, you know, well, well, what about the spirits or what about the gods? And uh, Confucius answered something to the effect of, how can you even talk about the spiritual world when you guys don't even know how to live your life on earth? Um, so, not to say that those things didn't exist, but they did not concern him uh, in the least bit. Uh, so, uh, many people today who still respect uh, Confucianism um, really embrace it more as a philosophy than a religion, really, because in some cases it doesn't really respond to some of those questions about you know, um, God and uh, uh, the afterworld or anything like that, the spiritual world. Uh, 
The second of the two great schools of Chinese thought that emerges during the period of Warring States is one known as Taoism. And uh, you'll notice that uh, to make your lives more difficult, uh, Taoism can be written either with a T or a D uh, in English. Uh, either way is fine by me. This is a statue, a very large statue, I should point out, of uh, the founder of Taoism, a uh, man by the term of the name Lao Tzu. Um, Lao Tzu is enormously respected, famous, uh, and uh, in terms of the historical record, it is fair to say that in spite of that, we know absolutely nothing about his real life. We have, uh, we have myths that come long after uh, his life by his followers. We really have a very sort of clueless more of how he really lived his life. Uh, the thing that, of course, though, is most important about Lao Tzu is his teaching, which certainly did live on uh, to his disciples. Uh, and specifically, um, his teaching of what he refers to as uh, the sort of abstract principle he knows as the Tao uh, is the most important thing about uh, this teaching. You will be very, very unhappy to learn that the Tao does not have a simple translation. Uh, nothing can. Um, so uh, some people refer to it just to use that term. If you must translate it, uh, some people use the term the way, which is obviously a little ambiguous. Or uh, sometimes the way of nature or the way of the cosmos. Any of those is possible in the translation. Because nothing is the nothing that you know. More importantly, of course, is what the Tao means. Lao Tzu apparently taught uh, that there is this kind of um, spiritual energy that flows throughout uh, the entire universe. Um, it, it is, um, and uh, it's kind of like electricity as, in a certain sense. Uh, that, um, the Tao allows the universe to continue to operate. It allows order. It allows for harmony. I mean, if the Tao were to stop moving, uh, basically everything would shut down. Um, now, um, it really was Lao Tzu's opinion that as human beings, what we should spend the majority of our time doing was to try our best to conform our lives uh, to the Tao, to meditate on it, to live a life very close to and in accordance with nature. Uh, and try, constantly trying to promote things like order and harmony. Interestingly enough, um, we think that uh, um, the practical implications of really embracing the Tao, um, becoming a Taoist, uh, is that he felt, uh, Lao Tzu felt that the majority of things that people really did in life that he, he observed around were at absolute complete waste of time. And instead of wasting all of your time learning, uh, going into politics, uh, going into the military, all of these things, he preached what he referred to as uh, Wu Wei. Um, uh, Wu Wei, uh, the best way to, to uh, translate this is disengagement. Remove yourself from everything in the world. Uh, you know, don't, don't go to school. Uh, don't show ambition. Uh, why, why bother all your time to try to strive in the way of the world? You should be spending your time instead um, living a simple life, living a life that's close to nature, uh, living unpretentious. Do they want you to be a permit? Uh, yeah. A permit? Um, Kind of, yeah. Uh, Paul, I think I'm going to answer your question in one second. Uh, but, I mean, in essence, I, he would be totally fine with being a hermit. That's kind of what like. It's also fair to say that at the end of the day, that's the Taoist temple. Um, Taoists tend to feel that, that uh, they're kind of the original small government people. They always they feel that the less government, the better. You don't need it. Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, and this may respond to the question, I mean, um, when Lao Tzu looked, uh, thought about how to reconceive the world, he did not see anything like a kingdom. Um, what he saw instead was you'd have these 
teeny little self-sustaining communities uh, that would barely have any contact with any other communities. Uh, and then, in fact, um, what, in one of his sayings, just to show how um, out there he was to some people, uh, he said that the, the first time you realize that you should have a neighbor is when their rooster crows in the morning. That otherwise you should almost be unaware that there are other people out there uh, in, uh, in uh, your town. And so there should be, um, basically there's no political order holding anything together. He doesn't, he doesn't think that's necessary for civilization to work. Or in fact, you probably would say civilization shouldn't work. Uh, it's probably a better way to put it. Now, um, Taoism uh, is a very interesting kind of career in China past this point, because Taoism uh, really lasts, and it goes on for centuries and centuries. Uh, but almost no one takes uh, it complete, uh, completely, or you know, takes very seriously some of his more challenging teachings. Uh, and in fact, there are uh, in later centuries there are uh, Chinese political figures who say, "Listen, I respect Taoism. I respect Lao Tzu, uh, but listen, I, I mean, I have to have a job. So, I mean, you know, um, the world has to continue moving. You know, if you really take Lao Tzu seriously, the you know, the entire civilization will grind to halt." So, even though on a personal level I try to respect the Tao, um, I don't buy it to the degree that I'm going to live off you know, this small community that's completely disconnected from the rest of the world. So that too um, uh, had its drawbacks. The final school I will talk about today that comes out of the period of war and states, uh, and for many students in the past, this has been by the way the by far the least appealing of the three. Um, just just to poison the well before I start speaking. Um, this school of thought is known as legalism, uh, and uh, one of its primary uh, really. The person who was the founder of this school is a man by the name of Han Fei, uh, who, uh, who comes up with this new philosophy. Um, he's a man, Han Fei was a man who was an aristocrat, who was a noble, lots of, uh, quite a, a bit of money, uh, and he, uh, he was part of one of these families in the period of the States. And you might say he had a vested interest in seeing order come again to China. Um, he wanted his family to be the most powerful. Han Fei had nothing but scorn for these other two schools of thought that we talked about. Um, he felt that, uh, in essence, um, uh, Taoism could never actually bring an end to the period of war in the states. Um, he felt that the only true order could be provided by legalism, which, in some ways, uh, was uh, a system of thought that was both practical and absolutely ruthless. It's fair to say that Han Fei and other people who, who, um, who embraced this school don't care much about things like you know, Confucius and ethics. Who cares about ethics? Who cares about morality? God knows who really cares about the place of human beings in nature. He felt that this was an absolute waste of time to think about. Instead, uh, if we are really uh, getting down to brass tacks, the only things that people should be concerned about in civilization uh, are is really basically uh, the state and what how the state acts. And in fact, the state, far from being uh, reduced into nothingness, uh, he was of the exact opposite of him state to grow, so it was by far the most powerful element in civilization. Underlying Hanfei's uh, little thought is a deep cynicism about human nature. If human beings were allowed to do what they do unchecked, the world would become chaos. And he proved that by saying, look out your window and see what's happening right now. That's a result of what human beings unchecked uh, doing what they do. And if you want to stop this nonsense, what you really need now is a strong state uh, that is going to go in, it is going to invest in only in things we really need. What do we need? Agriculture, because we've got to eat, and we need the military. Everything else can go away, because we don't need it. 
Uh, and so um, all of those sort of frou-frou uh, things that people were doing in this time, like scholarship, who cared about that? Why should the state support that? Uh, we don't need educators or philosophers. Uh, we don't need merchants. We don't need artists. So most jobs in society can be eliminated immediately without any great loss to his mind. As the name would imply, legalism, too, one of the major things that legalism is known for is law and lots of them. Um, when the state became strong, it could very clearly issue laws that would be, uh, uh, be, first of all, very clear to everybody. And second of all, um, they would be very harsh. So uh, it, the, the, main, uh, the sort of the end point of most of these laws is the death penalty. A lot of death penalty involved. Um, yeah, people had to uh, live in fear, or else they would break the laws. And uh, that may sound bad enough to you as is, but um, the way too that this law was observed was not just a matter of the state going around and checking their actions. Um, it was also this ideal of collective responsibility, which is to say, kind of just you know, all you writing out people who are not using masks or something. A very similar sort of idea where if I saw one of you breaking the law and I chose not to go to the state and to inform on you, what would end up happening is I would get the exact same penalty as the person who had initially broken the law. Uh, and that supposedly held, even if the person I saw broken the law, breaking the law was my own brother, I would have an equal obligation to turn him in. Um, I saw the minute. Don't shuffle. <laughs> um, you may, you may say, of course, and really in later Chinese centuries, um, legalism would be viewed with disfavor, and we also think that uh, for many people, even in China today, or even outside of it, taking courses like this, learning about legalism, they really do not like legalism as a philosophy, uh, but. Um, it, it is one of the interesting factors in history that uh, uh, when the, the, really the philosophy that helped to bring an end to the period of war and state, uh, finally bringing an end to all the chaos, was not Confucianism and it was not Taoism. Uh, in fact, uh, legalism was the, the school of thought that would finally help to bring an end to the chaos and the period of war and state. Once the Chinese actually worked with that system for a while, they found that they didn't really like what they got. But it was certainly tried before they uh, got rid of it. All right, folks, uh, we'll see you on Friday. Thank you.